hear me? Okay, good. Well, welcome everyone. Um, hopefully we'll have more people filling up the room as we start the panel. Um, thank you very much for attending the biofuels panel where we're going to talk about a burning issue, um, the threat of biofuels as a driver of deforestation. So the panel is going to be an informal question and answer discussion panel. We're most interested in hearing from the audience, so I hope you all are thinking about questions to ask. As you saw yesterday, the expectation is that everyone is very tech savvy and hopefully you've had lots of practice in the sessions yesterday. Um, we're taking questions via the Tropical um, Forest Forum app. Um, everyone is experts by now, I understand. <laughs> Please feel free to submit your questions in English only at any time, but if you prefer to ask your question in another language, we do have a microphone that we can pass around. And when you are submitting the question via the app or actually asking in person, we really do ask that you make your questions short, sharp, and to the point. Um, very important. Um, so um, I hope we get more. I know this is a bit of a wonky issue to many, um, but it, it's good to see the room is starting to fill up. Um, the biofuels issue is certainly complex and controversial with differing views between industry and environmentalists and also differing views amongst the environmentalists um, and also the scientists. And as you may know, there likely would not be a thriving biofuels industry if it wasn't for policies that we have in place to incentivize biofuels. Many of these policies are well intended aiming to transition economies towards renewable, clean energy. So how has it happened that we are suddenly faced with perverse incentives that can directly and indirectly increase overall greenhouse gas emissions? So in this panel, we're going to start digging into the issue of what really constitutes a good and bad biofuel, what we have learned through the implementation of current policies that are in place, and which policies are the best policies for ensuring that we only incentivize biofuels that do not lead to, bio to deforestation or other detrimental environmental and social impacts. Some of you may already have read the brief that was um, written for the, for the um, forum, um, and you all obviously will have a, an opinion on this already. But for those of you who haven't read the brief, I'd like to ask the audience a couple of questions. Um, so everybody, um, those of you who think biofuels are a good alternative to fossil fuels for transportation, raise your hands. Aha, okay. <laughs> so raise your hand if you believe that biofuels can be a good alternative as long as there is full accounting for greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, so we've got about half of you. So raise your hands if you believe we should do all we can to steer away from the use of biofuels as we transition to fossil fuels. Okay, and that's a nice mix. Raise your hands if you're completely indifferent or don't have an opinion on this. <laughs> I'm glad to see that everyone is opinionated. <laughs> so now, um, now that we have a sense of everyone who's in the audience, I'd like to introduce our panelists. So on my left is Representative Henry Waxman. Henry serves as chairman at Waxman Strategies, a public affairs and strategic communications firm advising clients on pub public policy. Before jo joining Waxman Strategies, Waxman was actually started by Henry's son. Henry spent over 40 years, or 40 years, it was 40 years, right? Um, serving in the US House of Representatives. Among other accomplishments, Henry was instrumental in pushing for the passage of the landmark Clean Air Amendment Act Amendment of 1990. And many of you will also remember his name from the Waxman Markey Bill, also known as the American Clean Energy and Security Act of 2009, the proposed national level cap and trade program that unfortunately never made it to the Senate floor for a vote. The conversation today might be quite different had it actually My name passed. Is Tim I Laura Buffett, the to the left of Henry, and manages Transport and Environment's campaign for cleaner fuels at the EU level. She focuses on making European biofuels policy more sustainable and preventing the expansion of high carbon fuels in Europe. Previously, Laura was a parliamentary assistant to MEP Sandrine Bellier, a member of the French Green Party. 
And um, to Laura's left is Adrian Suharter. Adrian is head of stakeholder engagement for Neste Corporation, where he is responsible for global stakeholder engagement for sustainability and public affairs, ensuring sustainability for a wide range of feedstock, including palm oil, but also animal fats and used cooking oils, and ensuring implementation of Neste's policies and, and principles throughout the supply chain. To Henry's left is Floyd Vergara. Floyd is Chief of Industrial Strategies Division at the California Air Resources Board. He oversees several of the Air Resources Board's key climate change and air quality regulatory pro programs, including the Cap and Trade Program, the Low Carbon Fuel Standard, which we're going to talk about today, conventional fuels regulation, energy sector programs, and oil and gas production measures. I don't know how you manage all that. <laughs> <laughs> I just clone myself so, a couple of times. But Floyd's been at the Air Resources Board for 30 years, so he is, um, you know, highly knowledgeable, and I think that is also a tribute to the Air Resources Board commitment to um, progressive policies. So with that, um, you can see we have an excellent group of, of panelists to educate us on the opportunities and challenges for renewable energy policies when it comes to biofuels. I'm going to start by asking each of the panelists a question to help familiarize the audience with the key policies. So I shall start with Henry. So Henry, during your tenure at the US as a US representative, the Renewable Fuel Standard was initiated under the Energy Policy Act of 2005, and it was expanded two years later. Since 2005, the Renew Renewable Fuel Standards, it's commonly known as the RFS, but I'm trying not to use acronyms, um, has been a significant driver of corn ethanol production. Could you give us a historical overview of the renewable fuel standard, the good and the bad, mistakes that have been made, and how they might be corrected? Thank you for that question. Um, in Congress, we were faced with a problem where uh, a, an additive called MTBE was added to fuel. It was a petroleum-based oxygenate, and people thought this would be helpful instead it turned out that it was poisoning a lot of the water systems and causing a lot of some, many people to get sick. <clears throat> so that was stopped from use. But then the Congress decided perhaps we can get a, 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 a renewable uh, fuel standard that would move away from that MTBE and allow for uh, uh, the additives that would do a good job to uh, make the fuel last longer. And we were hoping in the RFS, forgive me for using the initials, we were hoping when we adopted the RFS uh, in 2005 and in 2007, we would accomplish three goals. We would help local farmers. This would be a domestic production. If uh, we were going to use corn, which we expected was the primary uh, f form of the re renewable fuels, we would help. Uh, uh, we would help uh, reduce the dependence on foreign oil. We would support American fighters, and we would be fighting climate change. So we adopted the legislation. It went into effect. The hopes that many of us had was that uh, we would start off using corn because it was readily available to s to go right into the system. But what we wanted was a transition to cellulosic and advanced fuels that would uh, really have a much better impact on climate change. Uh, we would hope we would move that through that transition as quickly as possible, but we set in motion this whole production of uh, alternative alternatives to add to the uh, gasoline and uh, for transportation fuel. And in doing so, we saw consequences pretty quickly that we never anticipated. We saw that the, uh, uh, the, the amount of land that was going to, into production for growing corn was expanding very, very rapidly. It got to the point where we were using a, enough land in the United States and, and destroying that land the size of Belgium. So an enormous loss of land use. Uh, and fairly soon after the whole production of corn ethanol, scientists started reviewing it and decided there was no benefit at all for the climate. So we were seeing land use lo losses, we were seeing uh, 
uh, no benefit for the original purpose of the law. And beyond that, uh, we were seeing that there was a runoff uh, into the water system from the corn ethanol that caused an enormous amount of damage as pesticides and other chemicals were washed into the water and into even the Gulf of Mexico where there is a large part that is absolutely dead uh, because the uh, pesticides and other chemicals have killed whatever life there was. So uh, I think the RFS, the, the Renewable Fuel Standard of the United States has been a failure. And many of us have tried to figure out a way to change it. Uh, we've talked to the uh, key people in the Congress, uh, and we're faced with a lot of obstacles. The agriculture lobby is very powerful. The oil lobby, which is also powerful, would like to get rid of the renewable fuel standards, but they're facing another giant lobby with the uh, agriculture lobby. And, uh, and the environmentalists uh, now are starting to get behind the idea of changing this law, but they ha are not as effective as these other very too powerful special interests. So we, we need to change it, and we also need to send a message to anybody who's thinking about adopting a law like we have in the United States. Be very, very careful. So uh, uh, that's how we got into the situation we are in the United States, and we've got to try to get out of it uh, because we've, we've taken a wrong direction and we've made a serious mistake. Great. Well, if we, if we knew then what we know now, we would be in a very different position today. Yeah. But I think it's really important to be able to learn from the mistakes that have been made in the past. Mm -hmm. So, Laura, um, you've been pretty deeply engaged in the evolution of the European Union's Renewable Energy Directive. Also, I understand a recent decision was made by the EU on the Renewable Energy Directive post-2020, which has some positive and some challenging elements to it. Could you give us an overview of the directive and how it treats biofuels, and in particular um, speak about the recent changes and, and what they mean? Sure. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Um, so first, I wanted to thank the organizers for inviting Transport and Environment to speak today. Um, so I'm going to start by giving a historical background around European policies. Um, I think what happened at EU level is a bit similar to what happened in the US. Uh, for the same reasons uh, that Henry flagged, uh, we ended up having a target for renewables in transport that was adopted in 2009. So this target requires every EU member state to have 10% renewable fuels um, by 2020. Um, and what happened also is that at the beginning, researchers and NGOs were already flagging the land issue due to biofuels with negative consequences for the climate, but unfortunately, EU decision makers decided not to take um, these negative impacts into account. So we ended up, since the beginning, with a policy that did not fully take into account all the climate impacts of biofuels, allowing any type of fuel to qualify as renewable, palm oil being one of them. Um, after 2009, in 2011, the European Commission finally did an official study on land use that flagged actually the negative consequences of the policy um, showing deforestation impacts and showing additional greenhouse gas emissions due to uh, all the biofuels on the EU market. So what happened is that finally in 2015, there was a reform at EU level, the EU recognized the negative impacts of biofuels, and they decided to limit the amount of biofuels from food commodities that every member state can credit. So a member state cannot credit more than 7% biofuels made from food crops like wheat or rapeseed to achieve its renewable target. So that was kind of the main U-turn EU policy that happened uh, three years ago. Having said that, um, the situation on the EU market today is still uh, concerning um, because the majority of the market, despite the reform, uh, is made of crop biodiesel. And so 80% of the EU market is uh, made out of rapeseed, palm oil mostly. So rapeseed is around two-thirds of the EU production of crop biodiesel, and one-third is, is palm oil. Sorry. Um, Maybe an, an important element to, to flag as well is that the most recent study on land use for the Commission uh, that was released in 2016 shows that if you take into account all the land use impacts, crop biodiesel has on average 80% more greenhouse gas emissions than fossil diesel, and palm oil is the highest emitter with around three times more emissions um, than fossil diesel. 
Regarding palm oil, which is a, a very important issue for a lot of people in this conference, um, we've seen an increase in the use of palm oil for biofuels at EU level. Um, so right now, EU drivers are the top consumers of palm oil in Europe. Um, and having talked to some people who are not in the biofuels debate, I think not a lot of people are aware of that. So more than half of the palm oil EU imports is now ending up in transport to be turned into biodiesel. So that's the situation we're, we're facing. Uh, because of that, the EU biofuels policy in 2020 is expected to increase and not decrease emissions. Uh, and that's only the climate side of, of the issue. Uh, you flagged it already, but uh, you also have negative consequences on local communities, uh, on biodiversity, um, and also something we, we haven't said yet, but biofuels policies do increase food prices. And that's an element that is often forgotten, but we're burning food for fuel and that has an impact on the prices worldwide. Um, so after 2020, um, there's going to be a new law at EU level because the EU works in a kind of a 10-year um, framework period. So there has been um, a deal actually adopted two weeks ago at EU level to reform the law again after 2020 until 2030. And the key elements of that law are uh, first that there is no driver for food-based biofuels anymore at EU level. Uh, so what happens is that member states can decide to use food-based biofuels if they want to, but the EU is not obliging them to do so. So that's a very clear victory and I think um, yeah, a really good signal for the markets that EU is transitioning away from food-based biofuels. Um, then if a member state still wants to support food-based biofuels, um, there is a limit again on how much biofuels from food crops they can use. So there cannot be any growth after 2020. And additionally, there is a commitment to phase out the support for the highest emitting biofuels such as palm oil. Um, so the, the palm oil issue is not flagged so directly in the new law, but um, the Commission needs to come up with a, a measure next year that will really specify what kind of biofuels have to be phased out uh, of the support by 2030. Um, so there's been a clear change of direction at EU level. Um, we hope that the same kind of changes could happen in the US and in other places as well. Um, and now I think it's really up to member states to size the opportunity and to stop placing targets for food-based biofuels that drive deforestation. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Laura. Well, there you have a very progressive renewable energy policy that failed to take into the consideration land use emissions and has caused a lot of consternation <laughs> amongst the environmental community. Um, but is on the course towards correction and hopefully we can eventually get it right. I just want to remind everyone that um, we are taking questions via the app and please just go ahead and write your questions whenever you have them. Um, we will be taking um, questions in a, in a few minutes. Um, so next, I actually want to go over to Floyd and ask Floyd a question. Um, Floyd, California's low carbon fuel standard was the first of its kind to be designed it began implementation in January of 2011 after a period of very thoughtful design. Could you tell us about the low carbon fuel standard? Some people refer to it as the LCFS, um, but again, I'm trying not to use acronyms, um, as a tool for reducing the overall carbon intensity of California's statewide fuel blend, how it works, and what have been some of the challenges with its implementation to date? Uh, thanks, uh, that's a great question. Um, first of all, I want to thank the uh, conference organizers for inviting us. We're always thrilled to uh, come to these conferences, especially a beautiful city like Oslo. Um, and I will, you know, as a government bureaucrat, it's difficult for me not to resort to acronyms and abbreviations, but I'll certainly try. So um, I think from the outset we can all agree that, um, you know, climate change mitigation is going to require uh, a shift away from our dependence on fossil fuels. And in California, the transportation sector represents about 40% of the total GHG emissions in California. So in, we found that the solution that works for us is the low carbon fuel standard, as Belinda mentioned. Um, it's a regulation that's part of our comprehensive suite of, uh, of measures um, under our AB 32. Uh, it's our general climate change law uh, and other programs. And it's part of this comprehensive portfolio that's designed to address climate change and air quality um, issues. So the low carbon fuel standard is designed to diversify our fuel, our fuel pool and help enable the deep decarbonization of that transportation sector. Uh, it works with other uh, programs we have in California for controlling um, non-GHG air pollutants uh, from fuels and, and vehicles. Uh, 
So we think it's a success story in California, um, and let me walk you through that real quickly. The regulation man mandates a significant reduction in carbon intensity uh, in the transportation fuels, and it incentivizes the production and import of uh, lower carbon alternatives to fossil fuels. The regulation requires a 10% reduction in the carbon intensity of, uh, of uh, fuels by 2020, and that's relative to a 2010 uh, baseline level. And it applies to virtually all transportation fuels used in California. Uh, we recently proposed an amendment doubling down on that re reduction with a 20% reduction target um, by 2030, and we hope to finalize that uh, this fall. I mentioned carbon intensity. That's a critical design element for this program. It represents the life cycle uh, well-to-wheel um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and that's expressed in terms of carbon dioxide equivalent uh, per megajoule of the, fi of the finished fuel. Um, fi fossil uh, crude derived gasoline and diesel serve as the baseline fuels, so everything is compared to that. Um, we have uh, compliance standards based on gasoline and diesel. Those go from uh, 2010 down to 2020 with a 10% drop. And then um, the way it works is the, um, we tally up the uh, full life cycle carbon intensity um, scores for each fuel. Um, those, that, those fuels that have uh, carbon intensities that are below the standard in a given year generate a credit. Those are the, that are above generate a deficit. Uh, fuel suppliers that are subject to the regulation then tally up their um, credits and deficits at the end of the year. And uh, if the credits and deficits deficits match up, you're good to go. If they're short, then they have to go buy credits from those that, that have the, uh, the credits available. So I mentioned life cycle emissions. Uh, again, this is a critical part of the program. Um, the way we do the uh, low carbon fuel standard, it accounts for both direct emissions and indirect land use uh, emissions. And the indirect emissions are attributable to uh, carbon releases from land conversion that are uh, induced by demand for crop-based feedstocks. Um, for biofuel production, and that induced demand is a direct result of uh, renewable fuel mandates. Okay, so uh, you asked about uh, challenges. There are two main challenges that I would point out. Um, one is, uh, you know, we, we in the United States and in California uh, tend to be a litigious society, so uh, the LCFS has undergone a number of lawsuits. We've been successful in and prevailing uh, on, over most of those, we do have a couple remaining. Um, that, uh, those lawsuits uh, in the early years created uncertainty, and, um, and that uncertainty was related to the longevity of the program. That led to low credit prices, um, which have since climbed back up. Um, those credit prices were for an extended period of time, and it potentially limited the supply of uh, certain fuels to the California market. Um, this could also have suppressed investments uh, in low-carbon fuels, although there are several factors that um, play a role in such investments. Then the second part was, um, and I'm sure we'll talk about it some more, is the indirect land use um, challenge. So the accounting of uh, land use uh, change emissions in the life cycle analysis of crop-based crop, crop -based biofuels uh, has been really challenging. Uh, it's, it was a controversial part of the program uh, from its inception. And uh, we had stakeholders questioning the inclusion and quantification of those emissions. Um, our board decided, uh, based on um, uh, peer review, scientific peer review, and expert advice uh, from the expert advisory committee, that this was a real phenomenon. We had to account for it. And if we didn't do that, we were going to um, have unintended consequences. So it's a critical part of the program. So Great. Thanks, Floyd. Well, well, there we have a policy that really has tried to get it right from the beginning, had spent a long time in design and um, learning from <laughs> what's gone wrong, wrong in other areas, but still faced with challenges, and we'll learn more of those challenges through further questions. So next, I'd like to ask Adrian. Um, Adrian, I understand that earlier this year, or maybe it was this year, yeah, Neste Corporation ranked second on a global 100 list of sustainable companies. So congratulations. Um, a private sector company committed to, as a private sector company committed to sustainability, could you talk a bit about the challenges and opportunities operating in the biofuel sector? And also, how easy is it to be truly sustainable and to meet your profit objectives? Thank you very much, <coughs> Linda, for the kind introduction. 
Uh, thanks for the organizers as well um, for inviting us to this conference. I think it's, um, it's a different kind of conference that we're used to, but you know, it's, uh, I'm always open for new kind of opportunities we are. Um, so just a bit of our company first. So Neste uh, is actually a Finnish um, government majority owned company, and um, we were established in 1948. And the purpose of the establishment at the time was to ensure energy security into the Finnish market. So our main, <clears throat> our main mandate was set by the government is to make sure that the Finnish market has uh, energy security related to transport. In 2005, we decided to um, uh, diversify into biofuels and we opened the first um, refinery in Finland uh, for biofuels and then we opened another one in Singapore, another one in Rotterdam. And then after that, we um, took in a majority of uh, palm oil at the beginning and then now we diversify more into 13 types of feedstock um, being the big part of that is actually waste and residues. Um, straight to the uh, challenges, I think the biggest challenge for us, um, me being in the part in Asia that deals with mostly making sure that whatever we buy is sustainable, is the fact that we have to be able to source sustainable feedstock and also navigate through the changes within the regulation. As we were discussing previously, um, biofuel is a very highly regulated uh, market. And through that, we have to make sure that not only we understand what the law means, but our suppliers also understand the law mean. By saying that, um, the biggest thing that we realized when we went into the market is the fact that the model that the market works was not suitable for us. We could not work through traders. We could not th work through um, people that uh, you know, speculate uh, on feedstock. So we have to go straight to the suppliers and push our sustainability um, agenda, you can say that way. So we move the way we move straight to our suppliers, we educate the suppliers, we make sure they're certified, and we make sure that they also understand, for example, how carbon accounting goes and everything else. The opportunity for us, I think, is the biggest one is the development of new feedstock. Um, I don't know if anybody read our release this year. We found a technology to turn waste plastic into fuels. And um, later this year will be more commitment on that. And we have, um, every year we put in about, I was just reminded to put this number in, 44 million euros into um, research of new feedstock. And we have about 1,000 people in our R&D researching that. And every day um, in our company, we were always told that as a representative, you not only look into what you do, but you also open your eyes and ears on whatever new feedstock is available out there. Our commitment is to increase waste and residue materials. But and in the same time, we also um, are conscious in the fact that when we are talking about waste and residues, it's really hard to increase the demand for waste and residues from our side. So then we have to be able to be smart about it and see how we can develop new feedstock along the way. And um, <clears throat> the fact of us being humbled enough to be a second most sustainable company, I think it attributes to the fact that um, we have a team that um, reports and everything. We fill in every questioner. We fill in the CDP report. We fill in all the other questioners there. And uh, the key part of that is we, we engage with everybody. We engage with the regulators. We engage with the communities where our supply chain is from. We engage with um, a lot of different people. And the, the point of that is to make sure that we capture um, what you know, is the concerns and we capture what what did we overlook? You know, um, we always say that you know, when people um, point out some kind of um, flaw in our supply chain and everything, and that's good news because we don't, uh, we know the limitation of audits, we know the limitations of our team looking into it, and we we very much welcome these kind of discussions, and that way we can build a better supply chain and all of that um, materials. I, I think I'll, I'll cut there and then we'll see how it goes further great. with the discussion. Super. That's great. Well, there we have a very progressive company who's trying to be highly sustainable and learning how to operate within the policies, the very different policies that are out there. Um, I realize I actually forgot to introduce myself at the beginning of the panel, so I just <laughs> apologize for that. But I'm Belinda Morris um, with the Packard Foundation. I'm a program officer there. We've been funding work around biofuels for the last 10 years, so this, we're very comfortable <laughs> in the space. Um, we're one of the only, one of the few funders, um, along with actually Nick Fee as well and, and others, um, who have been um, active in the space for a long time. Um, so I just want to go through another um, set of questions to each of the panelists, and then we'll come to some of the questions that have been coming in from the audience, and I see that there are quite a few. Um, so first of all, um, 
so, oh, well, first of all, I just wanted to mention, in case anyone um, has read the biofuel policy brief, and I encourage you to read it because it kind of gives a real overview of the sector. Um, you'll know, you'll understand that accounting for direct and indirect land use change associated with biofuels production is a very controversial topic, but it's a very important topic, particularly for tropical forests. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about indirect land use change and how, how it is addressed. So first of all, I'll go to Floyd. Um, so um, you, you, start, you started out mentioning how the regulation um, looks at indirect land use change, but could you actually describe, um, help us understand better how it works and how it accounts for the indirect land use change? Describe which biofuels are part of the program what volumes these represent, and whether there have been any surprises. Um, second, it would be good to get an overview of how the standard accounts for emissions associated with biofuels, and in particular, how the policy accounts for indirect land use change, what has been the main challenges um, with implementing indirect land use change accounting, and how you've addressed these challenges. And lastly, I know these are all, lo it's a long question, but they're, they're short answers. Um, um, but lastly, has there been any biofuel derived from palm oil in the program? Yeah, thanks. That's uh, like the uh, college admission exam <laughs> that I remember. <laughs> Multi-part question here. So um, I did bring a couple of slides to help illustrate and respond to that question. Um, let me see if I can. So your question uh, originally was, the first part was, um, you know, which biofuels are part of the program. So let me show you real quick here. So um, here's a, a slide that shows the volumes of the different biofuels and alternative fuels, including electricity, and also the credits related to that. To that. So um, the, the LCFS was adopted, the low carbon fuel standard was adopted in 2009, and since then, the basic framework um, for, for the program has worked well and continues to support the growth in an increasingly diverse uh, low carbon transportation fuel pool, as you can see the volumes and credits growing for the different alternative fuels. So this chart displays the mix of alternative fuels that we had in 2017. Uh, as you can see here, ethanol um, in the blue, the dark blue, is still the largest alternative fuel on a volumetric basis, um, but its use has not expanded uh, significantly since the inception of the low carbon fuel standard. Um, basically all gasoline in California is at an E10 level. Um, but we have seen dramatic uh, uh, decreases in the carbon intensity of the ethanol that is coming to California, and that's uh, being done through mainly uh, efficiency improvements in the manufacturing of uh, ethanol. Um, let's see. We, we've also seen dramatic expansions in the use of renewable diesel, um, and that's primarily from uh, tallow and used cooking oil and biomethane, there's also biodiesel there, which is a uh, light blue, I believe. Yes, light blue. Um, and then uh, biomethane, which is upgraded biogas from landfills, dairy, um, dairy digesters, wastewater treatment, that sort of thing, over the last few years. And electricity is also beginning to emerge as a sig significant contributor. So in the first year of the low carbon fuel standard, the, al the only alternative fuels with significant market share were um, ethanol and natural gas. As you can see here, uh, today we see significant use of biodiesel, renewable diesel, biomethane, and electricity as viable low carbon transportation fuels. The, um, just to give you an example or um, put things in, into perspective, um, liquid biomass based diesels, uh, when the program started, I think we had a handful, probably close to 10, 14 million gallons of biomass-based diesel uh, in California. Last year, that was up to over four, 500 million gallons of biomass-based diesel in California. So we went from less than probably 0.1% to about 14% of our diesel fuel pool being comprised of biomass-based diesel. Um, biomethane is another success story. Um, we do have a lot of uh, CNG vehicles in California. We started out with predominantly uh, fossil uh, natural gas. Um, more than two-thirds of that now is comprised of um, biomethane. You see a similar uh, trend with credits here. Um, that was generated primarily from ethanol, biodiesel, renewable diesel, but we have seen 
a significant growth in biomethane and electricity. Um, for last year in 2017, electricity comprised uh, about 12% of the total credits in the low carbon fuel standard. Let's take a look at the breakdown of the biomass based diesel because that's um, a lot of where the concerns about indirect land use come in. So, um, uh, again, it, the low carbon fuel standard attracts clean fuels going into California, it's derived from a variety of feedstocks. In 2017, over 90 over 90% of renewable diesel and biodiesel brought into California um, was derived from residual feedstocks, uh, with almost 50% coming in um, derived from tallow, about 30% from used cooking oil, and about 15% from corn oil that's um, uh, extracted from distiller's grain uh, solubles, which is a, a byproduct of corn ethanol production. Um, as, so as you can see here, the um, the use of soy and canola or rapeseed uh, combined make up less than 7% of the total biodiesel and renewable diesel volumes in uh, 2017. So um, going to your other parts of your question, um, the crop-based uh, biofuel life cycles include emissions attributable to land use change. Uh, last land use change occurs when demand for uh, crop-based biofuels uh, leads to an expansion of cropland um, area to produce the feedstock and cropland expansion can occur locally as well as in distant places uh, and countries. The land conversion for agricultural uh, purposes releases embedded carbon emissions to the atmosphere and this is especially significant um, when carbon intensive lands such as forests and uh, peat lands are converted to grow crops. So in the early years of the program, um, we encountered significant pushback from stakeholders um, with regard to the inclusion of uh, land use change emissions. A number of arguments were presented, uh, including that worldwide land cover and carbon stocks uh, data sets were insufficient. Um, and it's difficult to prove that biofuel expansion indirectly caused a particular amount of cropland expansion and modeling results are too uncertain to assess quantitative land use change impacts uh, to a particular gallon of fuel. So in response to that, our board uh, put together an expert advisory committee um, with experts from academia, uh, government, industry, and NGOs, non-governmental organizations to uh, provide input and inform our process. Uh, basically, it's a, it was a peer review process um, that looked at the state of the art of uh, land use uh, change analysis. And um, as, a, uh, you know, as, a, as a result of that process and substantial public process that we had, uh, ARB uh, incorporated uh, land use values. We decided that um, this was a real phenomenon. The arguments really were about you know, the extent and how big the scope of that, of that issue was but we decided that it was a real phenomenon. We had to account for it, otherwise we could um, have unintended consequences. So we incorporated land use values uh, for relevant feedstocks um, and fuel combinations focusing on crop-based fuels, and we've continued to refine uh, those values um, as land use change science um, changes over, or evolves over time. The balanced approach that we had to land use change emissions quantification has resulted in limited participation of crop-based um, uh, biofuels, as you saw previously. Um, from that chart, soy and canola, as I said, um, biodiesel made up less than 7% of the total biomass-based diesel volumes last year. Uh, most of that, uh, again, was um, sourced from waste feedstocks. And with the inclusion of land use emissions, um, palm-derived fuels uh, generate deficits in the program which limit um, the supply of uh, those, uh, di those types of biofuels in California uh, transportation fuel, fuel. That's it. Great. Thanks. Sorry, I know that was a very long set of questions, but I think it was good to get that information out there. Um, so I just want to move to Laura. Um, the EU recognizes that indirect land use change exists but doesn't account for it. Can you describe how the EU deals with indirect land use change and what are some of the problems and challenges approached with their approach? Um, so as you said, the EU recognizes that there's an issue with land use. We have values for indirect land use change in the law, but um, what we call a, an EU compromise is that the values are there, but you don't account for it. So you recognize that there is an issue, but there was too, too much controversy around it to be able to really take it into account to really assess the life cycle 
uh, greenhouse gas emissions of biofuels. So unlike in California, there was not enough political courage in Europe to you know, fight the lobbies um, from the industry and, and adopt iLook. Um, now it's already good that there is a, a recognition officially in the law that indirect land use change is happening. Um, so what the, the commission decided to do is that because iLook was too controversial and they did not want to adopt it, they decided to set these limits on food-based biofuels, which de facto were supposed to also limit the indirect impacts of, uh, of crop-based biofuels. Now, looking at the reform that happened in 2015, the 7% limit that was adopted is not enough because we're currently only at 4% food-based biofuels um, in the EU transport energy mix. So you still have a possibility to increase the amount of crop-based biofuels that can be used at EU level. Um, so I think, I mean, the EU is clearly an example of a failed policy because right at the beginning, the right safeguards were not taken into account. So if there is any lesson to learn from what happened, I think it's uh, the fact that policymakers need to really assess previously what's going to happen, the negative impacts that are potentially going to happen, and make sure that this, the framework is including all the safeguards. Um, focus on quality and not on quantity. That's also one of the mistakes we've done at EU level looking at big targets for big volumes, driving the cheapest feedstocks, uh, palm oil and rapeseed, uh, but not focusing on the quality of the biofuels. And I think in that regard, California and the LCFS is um, the best example of the greenhouse gas target driving the best available technology and the best performing biofuels. So that's, uh, yeah, that would be our, our recommendation for what we can learn from the ILUC debate in, in Europe. Yeah, so we really need to get it right up front. Fixing mistakes mm. is really hard. <laughs> exactly. So Adrian, as... Um, as a company, what is your view on life cycle accounting for biofuels? Um, should indirect land use change be included? <laughs> and what are your biggest concerns? Yeah, uh, very good question. I think um, for companies like us, um, the value of biofuels is obviously the, land, the, the, um, the life cycle analysis. So I think that is very important and that has to be made right. Um, we published in our website anyway that we, we do believe I, I look exists. We believe it's real. Uh, the most important thing is the accounting for it. I think there's a few models out there, and the most important thing is to get the model right to uh, actually really account for the effects uh, of the eye look itself. And I think um, we, we are in discussion with a lot of different scientists and everything else to see uh, what model actually fits um, the, um, the current accounting methods. Um, as um, yeah, so basically. Uh, we, we look forward to you know, uh, the discussions on ILOOK and see how we can actually um, implement it into our carbon accounting system. Great. Yeah. Thanks. Um, Henry, um, we've heard that Canada, it, we know that Canada is um, currently designing a clean fuel standard, um, but we understand they're not planning to include indirect land use change accounting. Um, what are your opinions um, on on any policy that doesn't include indirect land use change? I think it's a mistake not to include uh, indirect land use changes because if you don't take that into account, you're really not getting the full model of what to expect in your biofuels policy. Going back to the original law in California, uh, I had an amendment in there to have the Environmental Protection Agency evaluate the land use, and uh, they had the language in the law, but they ignored it. Uh, the whole question of land use and life cycle is very complicated, and it's got to be done right. And I wrote to Prime Minister Trudeau, and I said, I know you're looking at a biofuels policy, but you must include indirect land use, otherwise uh, you're emitting something that it's an absolutely critical accounting tool to look at the imp increased impact of uh, biofuel crops. And without it, uh, it could be potentially... A Ba as bad, if not worse, than uh, the cl for the climate than the fossil fuel it was meant to replace. Canada is seriously considering what they're going to do next. It's at a crossroads. I certainly hope they'll take into consideration uh, the concerns that we've expressed. Okay, great. Well, I think um, we've, we've actually got a really nice set of questions coming in from the audience. So I think we'd like to turn to some of the questions that are coming in. And hopefully I can get this right. Um, I'm going to start with... Yay, it worked. <laughs> okay, 
So panelists, where are we on next generation biofuels which are not based on raw materials which be, could be used for food? Um, advanced um, biofuels. Perhaps we could start with Neste. Would you like to ask that in terms of where your thinking is? And then actually it would be good to hear from um, Floyd about how, you know, what's happening in the LCFS program and also um, what's happening in the RFS and um, in Europe in terms of advanced biofuels. So, um, uh, thanks, yeah. Linda, for the, the opportunity. I think this is a really important question, and I'm glad somebody actually asked about this question. I think that's the biggest question we also have in our minds in, in Neste, you know, how we can actually um, start using different kind of materials. Um, a lot of them are in research. If you're talking about uh, biofuels based on algae, microbes, and um, a lot of different new materials, you know, using um, fischer-tropos, a lot of different stuff. It's, it's actually, um, a lot of them are still not yet scalable the way we see it. But uh, having said that, as I said, Neste is putting 44 million euros per year to look into this and seriously considering how we can uh, look into different new feedstock. Uh, the one that I'm always excited for is the fact that we, are, we found the technology to make um, biofuel from waste plastic. You know, I think that is something that we, um, I'm quite excited for. And I think um, that would not be probably in the near future, not in one or two years from now. But I think from the, for, the, for the longer term future, we can see that developing in a bigger scale. That's where we see it. But um, at the moment, um, as I said earlier, Neste is looking into more waste and residues, looking for some kind of new kind of feedstock. Um, but in the same time, we are still exploring and uh, developing and seeing how we can upscale and commercialize the other ones that we mentioned. Great. Yeah. Thanks. Floyd, um, in your response, I wonder if you have an opinion also on um, Adrian's, the, what Nestle is doing on um, waste for plastic as a biofuel feedstock. Uh, I, I, I'm fully in support of that. I mean, I think it's a great idea. Um, a couple of things in response to the question, and I, I, I think it's a great question. Um, number one, you know, we have this uh, stringent set of standards, and as I mentioned earlier, we're looking to double down on that uh, with a 20% reduction target by 2030. As the compliance curve uh, tightens up on, or tightens down on the uh, carbon intensity requirements, we're going to see more and more of these advanced biofuels uh, come in which are, you know, much less uh, carbon intensive than the existing fuels. Um, the beauty uh, that we see in the low carbon fuel standard um, is that it recognizes and encourages those, uh, you know, gra those um, incremental changes and, it, and also uh, game-changing um, innovations rather than putting things in one bin versus another um, which are, in our view, uh, is not as nuanced and doesn't encourage those sort of uh, innovations. Uh, the low carbon fuel standard is set up so that it encourages uh, suppliers to find these new ways to, um, you know, find new feedstocks, um, encourages them to look at things like uh, gasification and pyrolysis, uh, fissure tropes, that sort of thing, um, scale those up so that it's more commercially uh, feasible. And then we're looking uh, a lot more at waste-based type uh, production and shifting away from crop-based. So I see that as a trend that's going to continue. I see liquid biofuels as having an, uh, an important role moving forward, uh, particularly in those sectors where um, electric electrification, which is our preferred mode of transportation, um, is not as feasible uh, using current technology. So that would be in the uh, heavy duty sector, uh, aviation, and other off-road se uh, sectors. So definitely we see that um, liquid biofuels, uh, other energy intensive fuels like that um, playing a prominent role in the years to come. Mm -hmm. Great. Laura? Sure. Um, so at E-level, the amount of advanced biofuels are still very limited. As I said, the majority of the market is just food-based biofuels. It's completely different situation than in California. Um, the kind of most important feedstock right now is used cooking oil, but for the rest, I mean, the quantities are very limited. 
Um, the EU law is actually putting specific incentives to make sure that we have more and more of these biofuels on the market by 2030. So they're going to have a specific target uh, that each member state has to meet, um, so to be reached by using feedstocks like agricultural residues or manure, so these kind of, uh, of things. Um, as an NGO, we see a potential for these biofuels to decarbonize the transport sector, um, but I think we also have to be careful um, to not set too high targets for these biofuels. Uh, it's kind of the same issue as with the first generation issue, but targets that are too high, you're likely to see displacements of the use of some of these waste and residues and indirect effects that we do not take into account. Um, I think it's also important to recall that some of these residues are useful for biodiversity purposes. If we look at forestry residues or agricultural residues, it's not like you can take everything out of the forest or out of the fields um, to turn it into energy. You, you also need to, to leave some on the ground and in the forest um, because otherwise you're going to have negative impacts uh, for biodiversity as well. Um, in terms of availability, um, what we've seen is that there are some um, feedstocks that are considered to be waste and residues by the industry, um, but which actually are not. Um, so again, if you look at the quantities that are available for uh, energy, they're going to be always very limited. Um, and looking at the example of uh, waste plastics, um, our colleagues working in the waste area would, would tell you that it's, uh, I mean, the most important thing is first to reduce uh, your waste um, and to reduce waste plastics. And so we do not want to end up in a situation where an industry is created and is kind of driving demand for more and more waste, whereas we should actually reduce waste, which is, should be the priority. Um, I think it's also the same message for transport in general. We're talking about alternative fuels, but the first thing to do is to reduce uh, consumption through efficiency measures, taxation, removing subsidies for uh, aviation. So all these kind of measures we also um, need to play a role. It's not only looking at alternatives that will help us to decarbonize transport. Great. Um, Henry, do you have anything on this? Well, the whole uh, promise of the legislation in the United States and other places is that we're going to uh, have a transition to a non-fuel based uh, uh, advanced fuels, cellulosic and other waste products that would be a benefit uh, if we could transform it into uh, biofuels. But we haven't really accomplished that goal. And in the meantime, we have incumbent groups like the corn ethanol groups uh, resisting any kind of change. And the scientific advances that we'd hoped for haven't materialized. There are reasons for it in the United States, maybe elsewhere. The, during the deep recession in 2008, the money wasn't available for a lot of the research that we expected to come online. So we've got to, to move away from food-based fuel to advanced fuels like cellulosic. That's the goal. That's what we want to keep in place. But in the meantime, we've given all the incentives that we could think of, and really the incentives we didn't think would accomplish this goal, to use uh, food and fuel. And that has caused a lot of uh, a lot of consternation, a lot of damage, and a lot of unintended consequences. Great. Well, I think um, the lesson here is that it's really difficult to get advanced fuels online. Though certainly that's sort of where all these different policies and some of the companies <laughs> would like to go. I think just on that, I wanted to ask one more quick question, and if you could all just take maybe a minute to answer this question because it's kind of relevant to this idea, but um, you know, going back to the different policies we have in the EU, the cap on food-based fuels, and then we have the use of ILOC, <coughs> indirect land use change accounting in the LCFS. So if you were to consider um, those two options, which would actually be a more effective a mechanism for reducing the risks of deforestation, um, the indirect land use change accounting or the cap or maybe even ban on food-based biofuels. I'm just curious. Um, Floyd? Um, well, you know, obviously I would be a proponent of the uh, explicit accounting for indirect land use change. Um, I think we've demonstrated that it works uh, with respect to um, uh, providing that accounting for the uh, emissions impacts uh, of uh, land conversion. 
Um, we are limited with respect to our ability to ban actual products and fuels coming into California because we have uh, these constitutional limits. Um, so what we do is we set a, a performance standard that every fuel has to meet, and if you can meet that, then you're allowed to be sold in California. So uh, even uh, palm and other uh, types of biofuels uh, can come in, but they are assessed a score that's commensurate with their GHG impacts, and that tends to uh, constrain the, the sale of, of, of those fuels. So in our mind, that policy works. Uh, the science continues to evolve. Um, when we first adopted the uh, regulation in 2009, I think we had uh, an ILUC value assessed for um, soy and, uh, and palm around 60 uh, grams uh, per megajoule. Uh, recent science uh, has evolved and we've uh, scaled that down to about 20 to 30, which is still significant. Um, so we are, the, the, the regulation and the, the agency, uh, Air Resources Board, we are open to continuing to monitor the uh, evolving science and we go back occasionally to revisit that. Um, so we're always basing our programs on the latest science, um, but we do want to make sure that it reflects um, what we see out there and that it's, you know, it, it's set up so that it, it allows all kinds of fuels to come in, but it's done in a smart way. Mm -hmm. Laura. Um, so at the beginning, we were really in favor of ILUC accounting and making sure that that would be taken into account <coughs> at EU level. Um, now we have to work with that limit on food-based biofuels. Um, I think the fact that it was framed as a, as a food issue was useful, um, but as I flagged before, having a limit doesn't mean that you're limiting the damage, and the limit we have today is just too high to have any impact, because we're currently lower than the limit, so you still can still expand and add pressure on land worldwide and, and lead to deforestation. Um, having said that, I think the limit was at least a signal on the market at EU level that food-based biofuels was not the future of transport decarbonization. And that led to actually a lot of industry uh, stopping their investments in food-based biofuels in Europe. Uh, so that was at least a good signal. Um, but looking at um, the failure with I look at EU level and the fact that the limit doesn't work, we are now really recommending to phase out completely the support to any kind of food-based biofuels because that just none of the tools that EU tried to, to adopt have worked so far. Um, and I think really this idea of using land for bioenergy, not only for transport, but also for heating power, where we see more and more whole trees being used to be burned in power stations, um, clearly shows that you have no um, climate benefits um, and you're just using the land in the wrong way for energy. Um, and that also brings me to, to one point that we don't flag so often, but if you, use, if you would use one football pitch of land with crops, you would be able to power around 2.4 cars for a year. But if you use it with solar panel, you would be able to run 260 electric cars with it. So the, you know, the way we use our land and like the, the efficiency of, um, of these kind of technologies also need to be taken into account. Okay, great. Um, perhaps I'll just go now to one of the questions that came up talking about electrification. <laughs> and this also kind of furthers from some comments that Floyd made earlier. So will massive vehicle electrification in the hopefully near future <laughs> play a role in reducing tropical deforestation? And I think this is a question that we're often thinking about, um, certainly when we're thinking about our, our strategy for bioenergy is what is the role for biofuels as we move towards um, massive electrification? So Floyd, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. So as I said earlier, you know, the, the state of California is driving uh, aggressively towards um, electri electrification uh, and zero emission technologies um, uh, whenever and everywhere we can. So um, that's certainly the case in the uh, light duty sector. Our governor just um, put forth a target of 5 million vehicles, uh, electric vehicles, um, by 2030. And so, um, you know, we're, we're pushing aggressively to, to put in the infrastructure and the uh, market mechanisms to uh, make that happen. So biofuels, uh, we don't think, is going to play, um, you know, uh, as significant a role in the light duty sector. There certainly will be uh, gasoline continuing to be used uh, in the near future, but um, we believe that that fuel pool will continue to be uh, shrinking as uh, uh, the mileage requirements uh, ramp up, 
cars get more efficient, people drive less, uh, vehicle miles travel, that sort of thing. Heavy duty sector, on the other hand, we, we see biofuels, as I mentioned earlier, continuing to play a significant role, uh, probably for you know several decades more. Um, so uh, as I mentioned earlier, the low carbon fuel sa standard incentivizes and encourages um, things like waste-based um, feedstocks because they don't have the indirect land use um, emissions associated with purpose-grown crops. Um, so there's the, the waste-based uh, aspect of it. Um, also, we're looking at uh, this year with our, our rulemaking, uh, including aviation fuels um, for the first time as a credit generator. So these will be um, uh, uh, renewable alternative jet fuels that are um, you know, using waste-based fuels to produce and displace some of those um, alternative fuels. So definitely we see that, um, again, ele electrification we see as having, uh, it's a win-win in terms of decarbonizing, uh, uh, reducing GHGs as well as those health impactful uh, air pollutants. Um, but to the extent that that technology is not uh, as feasible in the heavy duty sector and other off-road sources, we definitely see uh, high energy density uh, liquid biofuels playing a role there. So to the extent that that continues to play a role, we, we see LCFS, the low carbon fuel standard, um, the framework for it as continuing to ratchet down and making those fuels cleaner and more low carbon, uh, hopefully uh, uh, minimizing deforestation as a result. Great. Anybody else want to address that question? Um, yeah, I completely agree that electrification will help reduce our reliance on liquid fuels and liquid biofuels, particularly that drive deforestation. So it's uh, a positive um, element to, to look forward to. Uh, at EU level, the um, European Union is actually discussing a new policy framework for uh, cars CO2 regulation after 2020. So there's also discussions about having targets for zero uh, emissions vehicles. Uh, still not sure whether that's going to be a binding target or not, um, but there's clearly also a signal that EU is moving towards more electric vehicles. For um, sectors like shipping and aviation, I think there's more and more uh, tests of uh, electric ferries. In Norway, particularly, there's been more and more um, examples. So, I mean, the technology is also evolving, and some sectors which we did not think would be able to really move in that direction are actually moving there. Um, for aviation, uh, we also agree that it's going to be more challenging and that waste-based biofuels will have a role to play there. Uh, but again, a limited role because it's not like you can uh, fuel all aviation with uh, waste-based fuels if we look at the potential growth of the sector in the next years. Um, and another issue that we, uh, we wanted to flag is the, um, the um, electrofuels, so fuels produced from electricity but that are liquid fuels actually, so they're called synthetic fuels or power to liquid. Um, and this technology is evolving and getting um, to kind of commercial um, stage um, at EU level. And that's an area where aviation could also maybe benefit and kind of reduce its carbon footprint. But as I said before, I think for these sectors, there's also uh, much more to be done first on efficiency, taxation, avoiding subsidies, um, and then only looking at the, at the fuel. May I just uh, add to the information that we're sharing? In the United States, when we adopted the law in the early 2000s that set the RFS, one of the most attractive features of the law in 2007 was the fuel efficiency standards that we were going to require. I think the fuel efficiency standards and the move to electric vehicles has accomplished far more and will accomplish far more than the renewable fuel standard. Uh, we had such high hopes for it. Uh, we had high hopes for the advances that we would expect uh, in, in the transition period with new investments that uh, would bring about uh, renewable fuels that uh, would not be a, a, as harmful as the, what we've unleashed. But when you think of what we've unleashed, the destruction of land uh, to produce these fuels, uh, both in the United States and around the world, especially in the uh, rainforest, has been dramatic. Uh, even in uh, Argentina and Indonesia, where we've tried to uh, hope that they would uh, be stricter, uh, and therefore we have embargoes and some of the imports from those areas, uh, that doesn't mean they're not going to be directed somewhere else. Uh, 
uh, because if they uh, can produce these fuels, even though we wouldn't want them used, they're going to be used uh, in other areas where the mandates exist. So uh, it, I think all of this illustrates for me that once you put something in place, it's very hard to change it. And those that are considering an RFS law ought to look back and see the consequences that were not anticipated but could easily and have resulted uh, from, from the overly optimistic expectations that they uh, had when they were adopting laws that had these uh, consequences that uh, are very, very difficult. Just one last example. In the United States, one of the purposes of the RFS was that we, weren't going, we were going to be uh, released from our dependence on importing oil or importing energy, uh, and we would help the local domestic farmers. Well, the reality is that so much of what we're now using in the United States to meet the mandates is coming from overseas, and uh, coming not from the American farmers, but from the destruction of our rainforest. Quick opinion. And I want, the next question I want to actually focus on you too. So. Okay, just a <laughs> very quick one on this one. I think um, one, one thing that we re have to realize as well is that um, even though biofuel is um, using um, palm oil and contributing this, but the biggest consumer of palm oil is Indonesia and the bigger countries like China and India. So even though we completely stop, for example, there will be still consu consumption of this internally in the countries of these, um, you know, um, of these developing, developing countries. And I think, um, will it stop defor tropical deforestation? I don't think so. Um, I think what we need to do is actually educate and be more involved in the discussions within the countries and discussions with other industries that you're using it to make sure that uh, we can stop the tropical deforestation. If we only rely on biofuels and um, putting good pressure on us, I'm not saying that it's bad pressure, it, it will not stop completely. Yeah. And I think the most biggest markets that we have to take care of are Indonesia. And I know that Indonesia, for example, the experiment on sustainable palm oil is still ongoing. So yeah. I think um, that thing we have to realize that. We yeah, I think that's a very good point. And the fact that these oils can be used for multiple other uses. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And in Indi India and Indonesia, um, it's vegetable oil, that it's um, cooking oil that it's being used for. But so... Very good point. Um, I want to just go back to the, there's a question here on aviation, and I think we touched on that a little bit, so it would be good to, um, I hope I put the right one on the time. Yeah. Okay, so I thought Adrian um, could address this first. Currently, the ambitions for the use of biofuels for aviation um, does not seem to learn from past mistakes and will, and will increase demand for palm oil and other high ILOC fuels. Can this be avoided? <laughs> yes, I, I think the uh, discussion on aviation is, is quite uh, ongoing. Um, I think um, uh, probably Laura and Floyd can actually um, uh, explain further on the regulations on that because yeah. uh, we, I'm not quite involved in that. But I think um, one thing that we realize, you know, um, the use of biofuel for aviation cannot be avoided. And the current uh, biggest um, task that we have at the moment is to make sure that whatever, this is something that is going later on after the use of transport. And uh, whatever we have learned for the um, transport fuels, whether it's successful or not, can be implemented to this. Should we um, use iLook Factor? Yes, as long as uh, we can um, do this scientifically. As, as a private company, the biggest challenge for us in making business is to make sure whatever standard that the government puts, we can translate that down to our supply chain. If it's not translatable or it's not actually sound science, we will also get challenged on that. And the biggest uh, thing that we, we are afraid of is the rhetoric that happens because of the um, re uh, regulations set by the market countries and by the producing countries and the, 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 um, you know, the trade war beat drumming because of certain things that are not quite there. And um, I'm just, uh, as, as a private company, that's, we are concerned on how we can do, we can do business. I think, yeah. So, um, yes, we can uh, avoid that by learning from, from past mistakes in developing it. We can learn from the success factors that we have done. Uh, but I think um, this is ongoing discussion, so I think um, we can contribute as much into it. But as a private company, the aviation sector presents a market for... Of course, yes. Um, advanced, sustainable biofuels. Right? Of course, yes. Yeah, so, because um, we... Uh, 
we just announced that we are going into that industry. Um, we have done some trials with a few companies. So yes, it's definitely a big opportunity for us. Okay. Um, Laura or Floyd, you want to? Yeah, I mean, aviation um, is being discussed. So the alternative fuels in aviation is being discussed at ICAO, so the UN body for uh, civil aviation. Um, I would like to say that uh, we are confident that the framework they're going to come up for alternative fuels is going to be a good one. But unfortunately, um, based on what we've seen in the last months, it doesn't seem to go in the right direction. Um, basically, what, what's happening is that there were discussions to have a list of sustainability criteria for biofuels. Uh, there were 12 of them. And finally, the council at ICAO decided to go back to only two of them, um, making it basically just not useful enough to prevent the very high emitting biofuels to, to be used in aviation. Um, there was an ICAO meeting last week and this week. Um, I don't think they managed to have a final decision on that uh, yet. So there's going to be new discussions after the summer, I believe, to finalize the kind of framework around alternative fuels. Um, European countries and the European Commission have already flagged that if uh, the UN body and aviation internationally is not, is not going to go towards enough robust sustainability criteria, the European Union is likely to uh, go out of the CORSIA scheme. CORSIA is kind of the, the scheme that the aviation uh, industry adopted at international level to offset its emissions. So I think we're hoping that the European Union is going to play a role to prevent any kind of reckoning of the standards at international level, but we're not super confident that that's going to be, that's going to be achieved. Um, and I think one element that is important to, to recall is so that there is no transparency at all for drivers or people flying uh, about what kind of fuels is being used in their transportation. Um, and that's really the, the missing uh, point for people to be able to be aware of what they're consuming, the impacts of the fuels they use. Um, and I think as long as airlines are not going to be also transparent about what they're using and, and really telling their customers about what type of biofuels they're going to they're gonna use, uh, it's going to be very difficult to move in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Great. Do you want to say anything? Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, I mean, just... You know, real briefly, we, we, we see aviation as a significant source of GHGs, and that's going to continue to grow. So, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we're proposing to include aviation, renewable aviation um, jet fuel uh, in the uh, low carbon fuel standard as a credit generator. It will be scored, its carbon intensity will be scored the same way as the other fuels that are in the program. So, of course, we'll be looking at indirect land use uh, change for those, those feedstocks, and then making sure that we're fully accounting for that as we, as we move forward. So uh, we, I frankly don't see this being an issue uh, for the same reasons I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, those, those relatively high indirect land use uh, scores um, for palm and other, um, other, other biofuel uh, feedstocks would tend to constrain uh, the uh, viability of those fuels coming into California, both for um, alternative diesel and also for renewable jet um, purposes. Uh, the upside is, as we've been discussing with the airline industries, um, you know, we are, uh, we're getting a real sense that the including aviation fuels into the program is going to increase uh, significantly uh, investments in uh, production uh, facilities. So, um, you know, it's a win-win for us. You know, this sort of market-based program is in designed to encourage this type of investment. Uh, we get jobs, we get lower carbon fuels, and we avoid, uh, to a large, large extent, the deforestation issues that uh, have been happening elsewhere. So. Um, we see this as a positive development. Yeah. So I think there's no doubt the aviation industry is going to be a big challenge for biofuels and also the maritime industry. The IMO just put a cap on their um, emissions as well. But hopefully it will spur innovation in this sector, particularly for the, the truly advanced biofuels. Um, I just want to thank everyone for all your great questions. We have so many good questions here that I don't even have to go to any of my questions. Um, but we're not going to get to all of them, and I apologize for that. Um, I'd like to do go back to palm oil. So IUCN just launched a report that says banning palm oil from biofuel will actually lead to more deforestation as other types of vegetable oils require more land. What is your take on this? So... I think also in, in this question, perhaps um, you could talk a little bit about the substitutability, so not just the other 
the other oils, but also what happens to the other uses of, um, of the other oils, you know, what happens to palm oil when other oils come into the biofuel industry. Um, who would like to take this question? Okay, <laughs> and Laura, okay. Yeah, that's good. Um, basically, I think this is a, that, that report that came out a few days ago, I think it, it just highlights, you know, the, the, um, the way we see it, um, based, uh, the, the fact that we need to look into beyond what we can do in the biofuels, but look into what actually we can do in, in, um, in Indonesia first. The way I see it, right, tropical deforestation is still happening, even though Indonesia has a reduction of it, and in, um, it's happening more in, in Colombia and Brazil, as we see from the latest uh, Global Forest Watch report. But the most important thing is that um, as people are using uh, palm oil, um, besides biofuel, but besides the other industries, the most important thing is to make sure that whatever you buy is sustainable and you educate as well and help support the local governments in Indonesia and Malaysia, in Thailand, Colombia and everybody else to understand the importance of having sustainable production. I think that's, that's the important thing. Um, and, and we see that, you know, this is a big show as well that um, substituting one vegetable or another is actually not quite um, the answer for this. The most important thing um, is to develop and see how we can actually look into different kind of productions. You know, we, what um, can we develop new kind of feedstocks? Can we develop some more advanced type of feedstock? Um, what is out there and how we can actually use that? Banning this will definitely not in, um, be the solution. Um, substituting is not, but we have to look it out there and see what's what's available. I think that's um, it's, it's encouraging people to develop further and look into more. So I haven't read that study, but I've, I've read also some headlines that flagged that one of the key conclusions of the study is also that palm oil is driving dramatic impacts on biodiversity. And I mean, so it's not like the study is only flagging this. Um, I wanted to kind of flag again that why we're talking about biofuels is because you have policies supporting it and forcing drivers to use certain types of biofuels uh, in their cars. It's not like biofuels would happen magically and, and end up um, in our transport system. That's because of subsidies, of mandates, uh, that we end up having palm oil uh, or other vegetable oils uh, being used in Europe and in other countries. And so I think that's the element that we need to keep in mind. It's not like it's a free decision by drivers or anyone else to use it. It's because governments are mandating it and subsidizing it uh, for being um, used in energy. So having said that, um, it's clear that palm oil biofuels is the highest emitter. Um, so reducing or removing that feedstock from the biofuels uh, in Europe would actually be beneficial for uh, the climate and for the forests. And if nothing is done, actually, uh, we could face a situation which is very dramatic for forests. Uh, there was a, a report last year uh, about deforestation due to palm oil biofuels. And if you don't do anything, we're likely to see a very high demand for palm biofuels worldwide. And that would be equivalent to converting an area the size of the Netherlands, so deforesting that area, uh, just for increased demand for palm oil in biofuels. So I think removing that demand would be beneficial for the climate. Now, I agree that if you keep the same drivers, the same high targets, and you just remove one feedstock from the equation, it's likely to be filled by something else. And if it's soy or rapeseed, you're also going to look at indirect impacts and deforestation. So it's not going to solve uh, entirely the issue. And that's why we're asking for reducing the mandates or completely removing the mandates, if possible, on food-based commodities for energy. And that's going to be the best solution. So just removing one feedstock is not the solution, but it's going to help, uh, and just removing the entire mandate or reducing it further will help concretely. I had Great. just one point. Yeah. <clears throat> when we look at uh, soy being used, uh, uh, we, we sent a team out to Argentina to look at the use of soy uh, production there, and uh, soy oil being transferred into biodiesel for U.S. export. And we found tremendous damage to the, uh, uh, to the forest. And our team put out a report called Burned. And it, it, it talks about the deception, the deforestation uh, that has resulted from America's biodiesel policy. So what we may think be, would happen only in one area, it has other consequences. And this report uh, called Burned is an excellent piece of work from, put out by Mighty Earth.
which is one of our clients, that uh, points out the harm that's done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so again, it's really complicated, right? Yes. The whole issue. So we just have um, about eight more minutes left, and I wanted to pose one more question to um, the panelists. Um, so I'll, I'll start perhaps with Henry, um, but they're all answering the same question. Um, so what are your parting words of advice as other countries and states look at implementing policies that incentivize biofuel production? And particularly also thinking, not just thinking about, you know, Western countries, but also like the biofuel mandate in Indonesia and some of the other countries that have mandates that might not yet be threatening but could um, go that way. Well, my very brief advice would be uh, to tread very, very carefully. Uh, biofuel policy is difficult to do right, and the vast majority of biofuel out there today is uh, not better and likely worse for the climate than the oil and gas that it's supposed to replace. So uh, we would urge governments to make sure sustainable, advanced biofuels do not serve as a Trojan horse uh, for biofuels that are actually worse for the climate and the environment than the fossil fuels. Um, I would agree with what Henry just said. Um, for us, the priority would be to advise not to set targets for uh, biofuels made from food commodities, um, to move away from that option uh, as much as possible. Um, I think what we can advise is also to focus on alternatives such as waste and residues, provided that you have the right framework in place to make sure they're sustainable and they're kind of used in the, the quantities that are associated with sustainable availability in the country. Um, I think renewable electricity is also an area where we can really advise countries to, to look into more. Um, but eventually, I think the message is really to move away from the use of, the use of land for uh, crop bioenergy as much as possible. Um, I think the other part that we have to uh, look into this as well, like such countries like Indonesia and Malaysia, is um, in, in, in fact have targets for palm oil only as their biofuel source. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, the, the advice on that is to make sure that whatever is being done is sustainable, looking at um, you know, all the other factors there. And um, I, I agree with, with Henry and Laura on this one as well. And then one other thing is obviously the certainty of law and implement, implementing it for, for private sectors like us. The ever-changing law and um, you know, the uncertainty of how to implement it is the biggest challenge. So I think um, whoever is setting a law there should look into all the impacts, the climate change impacts, the fact that they should be substitutable to, to a waste and residue materials, but also look at how private sectors can implement it in efficiently and effectively without causing damage to the environment and social issues as well. Yeah, I actually had to go to a backup uh, uh, final point because Henry stole my, my point there. I was going to say almost exactly the same thing. Um, but yeah, I agree with my, my fellow panelists. Um, I think as a kind of closing point out there, we, you know, we went through a probably three-year process um, developing a low-carbon fuel standard, and we went through a lot of these same um, kind of soul-searching uh, debates internally and externally. We went through food versus fuel, deforestation concerns, all of these things, and, which led us to strongly... Uh, go into the um, the realm of indirect land use change. We we felt strongly about that. We still do. We think that's a critical part of the the central design element of these types of programs, which is a, a full life cycle assessment, including direct and indirect. So, um, to the extent that other jurisdictions are doing these are looking at these sort of things, low carbon fuel standard works for us. We're happy to to share with you our experiences. It's not the only way to do it, obviously. Um, there are other ways that you know may work for you, but definitely uh, tread carefully, look, look at uh, you know, unintended consequences, and really take an account, a full accounting of the direct and indirect uh, emissions, um, because you don't, wanna, you, know, you don't wanna solve one problem by creating another, right? I hope those words are heard by Prime Minister Trudeau <laughs> as they look at their policy because that's very wise advice. And California has been, and I'm so proud of California because I am a Californian, uh, they've been very careful, thoughtful, and devoted the time uh, to develop its policy, their policies in the, in the most 
comprehensive and thoughtful way. Yeah, I guess um, we actually have a couple of minutes spare, so I'm just going <laughs> to go back to Floyd with a follow-on question because a lot of people, a lot of questions in here reflect, you know, if we can get it right with palm oil and soy in terms of the sustainability and how they're produced and increasing production per hectare while reducing deforestation, how, how quickly and how easily can that be reflected in, um, in the regulation, in the, in the ILOC? Uh, well, we, okay, so there's, there's a, a little bit of a tension between, um, you know, reflecting changes in the science versus maintaining uh, regulatory certainty. Um, you know, uh, fuel suppliers, refiners, they need to be able to project out several years mm -hmm in order to figure out what, you know, how much to supply, how much capacity they need, all of that stuff. So, at, you know, we continue to monitor the scientific developments. And, of course, as I said earlier, we are always willing to go back and revisit it. But we're mindful that we don't want to do that, you know, every six months or every year um, un unless there's major changes in the, in the science of indirect land use. So we continue to monitor it, but unless there's something that really moves the needle, we don't change it for you know two or three years just to maintain that that sort of regulatory certainty. Great, that's great. Well, I think that the message is we need to all continue to focus on pushing for more sustainable production of palm oil and um, and soy and um, other feedstocks that go into biofuels. But we also really need to focus on getting these policies right, and um, we need to also work through some of the controversy in um, the accounting mechanisms and um, try to make it easier for these policies and for the policymakers to feel comfortable about taking on these types of, of policies. Um, so I want to thank everybody. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank this fantastic set of panelists um, for coming, most of them, many of them from very far away, California, Washington. Well, Brussels, still far, <laughs> <laughs> and Indonesia. <laughs> and um, I think we had some California. really good representation of the issues, and I hope it was informative for all of you. And I, I just can't believe how many questions we came, had come in when we don't even have a full room. So I really appreciate <laughs> you all's attention to this, and I'm sorry that we weren't able to get to all the questions. Um, so with that, um, thanks very much, and um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.